Hey traders, David Frost, my strategic forecast. You're here for another episode of Common Sense Market Analysis. Today is Thursday, March 25, 2021. We're looking at a daily chart of the SPY or Spider, which is the proxy for the S&P 500. Once again, we have a lot of stuff on the docket to discuss. We're going to discuss things that came right out of the course, lazy e-mini trader. We're going to discuss a few things the market did today that are extremely important. You have to look under the hood on the charts to see what's really going on. What we're going to do here is try and gain a better understanding of the why behind everything that went on today. The first thing we'll do is take a look at the daily chart and let's see what's jumping off the page. There's a couple of things that do jump out. So A number one, we have that 383.65 and it certainly looks like the market went down there and bounced off that line today. We know that's more important from a weekly chart perspective, so we're more interested in that number, whether the market is above or below that number, based on the Friday close, the weekly close. However, the market was not down exactly to that number, they did come close. If we just slide over the chart so you can see the actual numbers, you'll see today's low was 383.90, 25 cents away of the red line. Do you think the market participants know about that spot? Know about not really the red line that I have on my screen, but that general area and the fact that it is important. And when you see a market go down and run a test of somewhere, and we're going to see that more throughout the day, this wasn't the only test that got ran today. When you see a market do that, and they get out of there in a hurry, they're running a test, and thus far it was a successful test. They ran a test of that spot. Coming up 25 cents short counts as the test. What else is jumping off the page on the weekly chart? Well, let's go back to the lazy e-mini trader course. Let's think to the high, let's think to today's low, let's think about talking full stack stuff. We had time was on our side. They filled a gap over here. So in terms of the low, the low actually satisfied the gap that I'm calling 384. 66. Then you would ask, and if you were inside the numbers, you might ask, hey, wait a minute, why weren't we buying the gap if that was a gap and all the other stuff kind of stacked up? And the answer is, I was looking for a lower number. And I'm going to explain why and the need why I had to look for the lower number. The market really gave me no choice. We'll get back to that in a moment, but just as a general rule, Let's think in terms of full stack. We think in terms of the market came down for a specific period of time, so it satisfied time is more important than price. It filled a gap, so you start to get the full stack kind of thing going on. Which leads us to the next question, was this just a pullback, made a higher low? We talked about this last night, right? We have to be the umpire calling balls and strikes. Now. Is it possible that this was a higher low, once again, just a pullback, and what we're talking about is the market goes up, it pulls back. The market goes up, it pulls back. The market goes up, it pulls back. The market goes up. One of those times, it doesn't go back up, and we could be in a scenario of the market goes down, finds the higher low, and goes back up again to make a new high. Is that probable? Am I expecting a new high? Absolutely not. Now here's where we have to step back and gain an understanding of what's going on. And this is from my perspective, from where I sit, you're inside my head. I'm not suggesting everybody has to feel this way, but here's where I am. The market is going into corrective mode. They're through a process making a top. When the market gets into these corrective modes, we get wide swings in both directions. The candles end up wider. The rallies end up stronger. They're short covering rallies. They're hard and fast. People get pies in the face. Traders like to short on the way down. A lot of traders will, like I like to say, short in the hole. They short in the hole. The market whips back up in the other direction. They get a pie in the face and the rest is history. We know of it all that. 
All that goes on in these phases. The market is designed to make you think everything's fine. The market's designed to make you think they were going into the abyss this morning, and by this afternoon, all is well. That's going to happen over and over and over again, especially if you watch the news. I don't know what they were saying on the news, but all I know is when the market turns bullish during the day and it started out bearish, the media changes sentiment for you. They begin having a different conversation, which leads you to have different thoughts. That's the emotional circle jerk of the market. Is 292 still important? Yes, it is. Can they go back up? Can they spike 292? Can they get up to 394, 394 and a half? And I know I just said 292, but we meant 392. Can they get up another buck and a half from there? Two bucks from there, two and a half bucks. Yeah, they can. There's no reason they can't. Think about what went on today. They held the 50 period moving average. The bulls are going to love that. They spiked it, they reversed, they filled a gap. So you really did have somewhat of a full stack going on today. All these things that I'm mentioning are taught, discussed in detail in the course Lazy E-Mini Trader. On the flip side, can you wake up to a big gap down tomorrow and this was just a big fake out? And the answer is yes. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, but the awareness is in these corrective phases, you must and I repeat, must expect those kind of scenarios to unfold. You're going to wake up to big gap ups after a big down day or two or three. You're going to also wake up to a huge gap down where they're throwing out the baby with the bathwater and the kitchen sink all at the same time. We haven't really seen anything like that yet. You will. At present, unbiased, playing the umpire, the trend is your friend until she dumps you. Back above the 20 period moving average, having spiked the 50 and reversing, having finished positive on the day, we could get follow through on Friday. They certainly don't like to kill them into the end of the week. So finishing positive on the week is in the cards on the table. Now, here's an hourly chart. And before I was talking about why I was focused on a different number than that gap we discussed at 384.66. Back to the daily for a second. Let's get a visual and understand the way I think about things. Okay, so here's a gap, and the way I look at it, it's 384.66. It's on the daily chart. Okay, we're discussing or we're actually trading intraday during the trading day, which is one part of the day. Intraday, they don't necessarily have to bounce off that number. It's a daily chart. They spike it during the day. They go much lower during the day. What really counts, at least from where I sit, is where they close the day. When they go to hit a gap, are they going to close above it for the day or below it for the day? Spending time below it during the day is normal garden variety market behavior. Closing below it today would have been slightly different. Now that we've got that picture in our minds, we're down to the hourly chart and there's that 383.65, it's kind of in between everything. So I was focused on 383. Why is that? Because it's a different gap. It's an intraday gap off the hourly chart. So look at this. Here's my 383.11. So that's the exact number. I was saying 383, give or take. We had another important number, and you'll see this inside the numbers when we get there. The low here is 385.31. So they're in between. So as far as I'm concerned, during the day, especially while there's selling pressure in the market or on the market, why not go down and fill the gap? Now, a lot of times they come up short, they bounce away, and then they come back to fill it later. That was certainly in the cards until they got too far away and above the gap left open from Wednesday. Once they got above that and closed above that, it was really all she wrote. This is all tour guide stuff. This is all reading the tape stuff. It's also in my mind. It's, it's dangerous. It's a dangerous place to be. But inside my head, this is the way I think about the market. When I look at a chart, I'm doing no different when I explain it to you than I think to myself when the chart populates the screen, whatever time of day it is. Speaking of inside the numbers, let's go through the commentary. We'll circle back to stocks on the move. And you know the drill. We're going to look at the good, 
We're going to look at the bad. We're also going to look at the fugly if there is any. But more importantly, I think you need to pay attention to the commentary today. There's a lot of learnable stuff in here on how to read the tape. Happy Thursday. One way to look at the tape is a quiet overnight session where nothing happened. Another way to see it is a bearish wedgish formation created during the overnight session. What was I discussing? What was I looking at? This is the S&P E-mini futures chart containing the electronic data. Is it data? Is it data? Is it data? I like data. I was looking at this area here. This is what happened overnight. They made a move downward. They stayed inside of this big breakdown candle. They consolidated. They ate time off the clock. They built a bearish, wedgish, flaggish kind of formation. You can use any terminology you want, but normally, until and unless they were able to get above the high of this breakdown candle, they were going to release that energy in the southern direction. That's what I was looking at this morning. That was on the board at zero dark 30. Here's the eight o'clock candle. So after eight o'clock, that's when they started to kill the tape. And they do that kind of stuff so that they let traders or don't let traders into a trade. They make you gyrate around after the market is open. They want you to get FOMO. That's why these things happen. You see the market falling. It's falling in the pre-market. You think it's going to fall more after the open. You sell the market or you buy puts or whatever you do after the opening bell only to find out an hour later they're reversing it in your face. They do it all the time. That's why we don't sell in the hole. You sell resistance and you buy support. You sell when other people are willing to pay more and you buy when stuff's on sale. Moving right along. Early thoughts. They're doing more of what we expected from a big picture perspective. How much lower today? Well, we don't know yet, but what we do know is we've got the 50 period moving average that comes in around 386. We'll get back to that. Ironically enough, they're hanging around there in the pre-market. There's a gap at 384.66. There's your gap. And then we have our weekly bogey around 383.50, give or take. That was that red line. We start the day with an understanding of what the important spots are and why. Then we can begin to narrow down the opportunities and where. So we had the important spots without knowing, obviously, what was going to happen. We don't know if the market's going to keep going a lot lower. We don't know if the market's going to reverse on a dime and finish on the highs. We certainly don't know this at 8 o'clock in the morning. We're setting the table, gaining the information. We're collecting the data that we need. Moving right along. 9.05, net net, here's what we've got this morning. There's a big spot at 385.31 that should produce a bull bear battle. Below is no man land and a lot of space before the next number around 383. The gap left open from yesterday is around 387.50 in case they pop them at the open. We're narrowing things down We've got numbers to work with before the bell even rings. So let's get our faculties a little bit so we have some imagery. Right of the vertical is today's activity. We knew that. 385.31, bull bear battle. Yep, it's right in that zone there. And then they did it again, only they dipped lower, and that's where I was looking for the 383. They didn't get there. 386, another important number. You'll see that repeated throughout the morning. 386 was essentially our pivot. Now these two numbers are close together, but the numbers are the numbers. The two numbers represent different things, and it's not the pivot because of the 50 period moving average. A moving average is never going to be a pivot. It's just an average, but we use it as a guideline. The 386 came out of a different reason, supported by the fact that the 50 period moving average was there. All right, what else you got? We're moving along, by the way. When I say bull bear battle around 385.31, in the process, it's normal if they spike 385, which is a fat round number, and then snap back. Awareness, again, before the opening bell. What is that? It's spiking below 385.31, spiking below 385, and snapping back. You see the words, but I want you to get the visual of what it looks like. Normally, you see the picture and then the words. In this case, you see the words and the picture follows. Pretty funny how that works. 9.30, right out of the chute, DraftKings. We'll get to that later. 
Enough said. We're moving along a little bit. 939, there were no man's land. The only thing up north is the gap, 387.50, 387.49, whatever. It doesn't matter to the penny. You get the point. And then 385.31, which is a line in the sand for lower prices. They're kind of in the middle. They're going to do one or the other, at least make a run. That was at 939. So here's the candle ending at 940. So after that, you see what happened. They did both. They went to run a test of 385.31, and then they started going back up in the other direction, and then they went back and forth, back and forth. We're moving right along. For now, 386 is our pivot. Below, the door is open for 385, give or take. Above, and they try to rally and fill the gap at 387.50. It's precisely what happened. 955, check this out. You see what's going on around 385.31 and 385? It's normal. A trader can scalp a spike of 385 on the long side, but there are, really isn't a spot, a juicy spot to be a buyer at present. Now, what does that mean? Sounds contradictory. What it means is they're going to snap back from below 385. Even if they go down a dollar, even two dollars, they're going to get back above 385, 385.31. But in terms of being a buyer, that was my 383. I wanted to buy 383. They didn't get there. And the difference is that wouldn't have been such a scalp. That would have been one of those take a profit and let the rest go. This could snap for a while. Anyway, just to be clear on that, and we're moving along. They were going back and forth. The defense had a successful goal line stand so far down around 385.31. Here again, I'm explaining that it wasn't necessarily an important number as more of a technical reason why the market will find support. Other traders are using that to make the trade. They're using that area. So therefore, when you know that other traders are in a spot, other traders meaning, I'm not talking about Robinhood traders, I'm talking about big money stuff. There's money going to sit at 385.31, 385.00, 384.50. In that neighborhood, they're looking for that snapback. But it's not one of my important numbers. That's the point that I was getting across. It was just a technical trade. And 386 was still the pivot, which means above, and they'll still try for the gap. Increase in volatility creates larger swings. By 10.02, basically in the same minute as I was writing that, they started to move, and there they go. And I swear they went after the post. That is true. But as I was making the post, they started to move up, and that was the end. They filled the gap. From here, what I'll do is let you pause the video, read the notes, go back to the charts and double check the work. Read the stuff. There's stuff to learn in here. But I want you to double check the work if you're at all interested to be or already are an intraday trader in the SPY, S&P 500, leveraged exchange traded products, options on the SPY, the futures in the ES contract, all or any of the above is applicable, and if you're doing that, I guarantee you that you can benefit from having a tour guide. Now, let's read this one. It's ironic that I stopped at 1133. There are no accidents nor coincidences anywhere. A lot of emails asking where to short the market. So at this point in time, traders are thinking that they're just getting a bounce and they're going to go back down later. Now, they weren't saying, meaning the market wasn't saying one thing or the other. It wasn't specifying anything in particular, but traders want to be short. It's an allure. Traders want the quick drop. They want to buy puts. Whatever the reason is, they want to be short. They're looking for a reason to short the tape. So here's what I put, and this is where I say you can learn stuff here during the trading day. There's value inside the numbers. Let's discuss what happened. The market went down almost to a really important spot and bounce back up. They've recaptured an important spot of 385.31. So they ran a test of an important spot and they recaptured it. All right, let's put that in our back pocket. The hourly chart has a tail candle from hour number two. Let's get the visual. There's the tail candle from hour number two. All that said, and now we're getting into the lunchtime portion of the day. We're getting into where the volume actually decreases. There's less market participants. The market tends to go into float mode. Now, obviously, it can go down at any time during the day. But this is what we talk about normal versus garden variety versus not normal. 
We use the 80-20 rule. 80% of the time, they just do the same stuff over and over and over again. Then there's a portion of time where they do an anomaly. They do different stuff. Well, most of the time, around lunchtime into the early afternoon, they're floating around. Do you want to fight the tape while they're floating around? So here's where I say they might come back down again, but the setup is not there right now. That said, 386 is still the pivot, closing candles above, and they'll push higher. They can push higher. Not closing candles above, and they'll likely drip back lower. Well, you know what happened? What I hope I did was prevent traders from shorting the tape. Now, 1233. They just closed an hour above 387.50, which is either a signal or a fake out. What am I talking about? The hourly close above the gap left open from yesterday is an important spot. Closing candles above that gap is bullish behavior. Close an hour is more bullish than a 10-minute candle. That's just the way it works. So when they close a candle up there, it's almost like sending a little flare up in the air saying, hey, that's bullish. Continued candle closes above, opens the door for 388.60, and then 389.50 if they're really strong. And there it is, back on the five-minute chart, 388.60, and you see what happened here. Right up to it, spiked it by a little bit, pulled back, made a higher low, and then went up past even the next number. You see how they took some time to get through the 389.50. Again, pause the video, read this stuff, and double check the work. It's good information. It's tour guide information. It's learning experiences. Stuff you can take to the next trading day, the next trading week, the next trading month, year, and so on. All this stuff is a full stack. Stocks on the move. Some of them didn't hit. Some of them did hit. So we're going to look at the ones that did hit their price objectives today. FCX, DraftKings, and First Solar, FSLR. Three hit, four did not. So be it. That's fine. By the way, sometimes I'll get an email or someone will post something under the YouTube video and they say, hey, you stink because sometimes a lot of your selections don't hit their numbers so we don't get the trades. What they don't understand, and this is where you don't know what you don't know sometimes. You can make a living. A professional trader can make an absolute blockbuster living on two, three trades a day. They make a good living on one or two trades a day. Now there's caveats to that. You can't make a living on a $5,000 account. I get that. But in large, by in large, traders are not looking for five, 10 trades a day. They know the more they trade, the more susceptible they are to a loss. The first one we're gonna look at is FCX, Freeport McMoran, getting a haircut at the open. 29.62 was the number posted on the board. You see what happened, the rest is history. They came into it, spiked it by a little bit, immediately turned around and went back in the other direction. The number worked. And by the way, why did they get there? They got there because the rest of the market was selling. The SPY was going down at the same time. So it pushed other stocks down with it. It's like throwing the baby out with the bathwater. When they caught the market at the open and they started jerking it around, that's what happened to some of the stocks. Instead of going down to their numbers, they get caught in an updraft. When they sold the market later, some of them came into the numbers. How about DraftKings? Look at this one, right at the opening bell. The opening print happened to be 63 78. They ran right down to 62.60, making a low of 62.53. Then you got a fine, how do you do, an immediate rocket ride back in the other direction, and the high, just minutes later, was $65.82. Traders were able to take any amount of profit in between they wanted to. They came back to revisit the number. Do you think this number was important? Yeah, of course it was. The numbers work. Yesterday, we talked about the difference between an 83% win rate and a 17% loss rate. We focus on the 83% and we always want to win, but we lose sight of the fact that in this business, we have to deal with the 17%. It's the law of averages. For solar, 75, 73 was the number posted on the board bright and early. They hit it, they spiked it, they turned around and had a rocket ride. The numbers work as do the law of averages. What's going on over in Camp IWM? Well, yesterday we talked about this pivot low, 207.21. What was the low today? 208.03. 
So they never even ran a full-on test of that pivot, but they got right out of there. Same story as the SPY. The market knows about that spot. Now look at the position of the IWM as compared to the SPY. Again, below the moving averages, below the 20, below the 50. Different look on the SPY. Again, this is my favorite market leading indicator. This market was selling harder, was selling more than the S&P 500, primarily because it was inflated more. You know the saying, the higher they rise, the harder they fall, all that stuff. It's, that kind of stuff is true. 223 would be an important line in the sand. Are they gonna be able to get above 223, 224 on a daily closing basis? If they do, and they're able to get back above that moving average and the 20 moving average, which would put them obviously back above both, there could be another leg higher. They're not there yet, we're just looking at it from a distance. What about the folks down at the transportation department? Nice test of the 20 period moving average. They missed it a couple of days ago. They had an opportunity to hit it. They hit it, they kind of touched it, a little gentle touch today, and now they're rallying back up near the old highs. So, a couple of ways to look at this, right? We talked about this. Is this just eating time off the clock in a bullish formation like a flag pattern? I mean, if you're calling balls and strikes, you have to be able to see that. The transports are my second favorite market leading indicator. It's a puzzle piece, it's on the table. You have to look at both sides of the tape. And after all that, the cues don't go anywhere. It's really a mixed tape out there. We still have divergences. One market gets a tremendous turnaround and rallies all the way into the end of the day. Another market's testing their all-time highs or close to it, the transports. We have the cues that really couldn't get off the mat. When you see this kind of behavior and you don't have broad-based participation on what looked to be a turnaround day, if you're looking at the S&P 500, then you know under the covers there's other stuff going on. It's not going to all materialize in the same day, but this is all indicative of the change in character, change in complexion of the tape. Financials up today, recapturing the 20 period moving average, closing pretty much right on it. Reversal day, finish on the highs, that's bullish behavior. Doesn't have to mean they're going up with follow through tomorrow, but that's what they left us with today. You know, if we look at the weekly chart of the financials and I take a look at that candle last week, I say, all right, 35.29 is the high. We're at 33.84. Let's say they go up tomorrow on Friday. I'll play that game. I'll short the XLF against the weekly close of 35.29. Write that down. We'll see what happens. Smash Mouth rallied a little bit today, but four tenths of 1% on a day when the SPY had a pretty good turnaround finish at the highs of the day. Well, this finished at the highs of the day, but they didn't really go up a lot. The tech sector across the board is showing weakness. The tech sector was loved. What we're seeing is institutional distribution of overweight in the tech sector. It's pretty much that simple. Have I told you how much I appreciate each and every one of you? Without you, these videos are not possible. That is true and accurate information. We're gonna pull the ripcord here today. I'm David Frost, my strategic forecast. Thanks again for tuning in to another episode of Common Sense Market Analysis.